Hello and welcome. For our final Captains of Industries conversation in this series, I'm honored to be hosting Sultan Ahmed bin Sulayem, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of our DP World. Let me give you a quick size and scope. Simplistically, they describe themselves as a leading provider of smart technology solutions, enabling the flow of trade across the globe. But let me tell you, DP World's operations encompass global supply chain solutions, specializing in cargo logistics, port and terminal operation, maritime services and uh, free zones. Joining me for this conversation, as I said, is Sultan. Thank you very much for, for the time. I was going through your uh, company's uh, news items and uh, one thing that I established is all the, the, the sheer size of the company we're talking about here. 100,000 employees in 75 countries across the six continents of the world, but I'm more interested on what you did recently which is to come into the continent of Africa and uh, open up the port of Berbera, uh, establishing that edible oil business. I want to know if there's more to come and what the thinking is around the continent. Well, the continent is very important for us. We are uh, well established uh, in Africa. Uh, we believe in the growth. Uh, we've seen the growth in every part in Africa. Uh, there's no issue of growth at all, and we are a company that we like growth. And we will invest where we can see growth and where we can add value. And so when you look at West Africa, we are investing heavily in Senegal in an ultra-modern uh, port that is strategically located uh, near the airport, the new airport, near the industrial area, and in deep water. This is uh, the construction started already. We've been to Senegal uh, already for a long time, since 2007, but uh, 2010, sorry. But this is a new uh, investment that will cater to the uh, demand on West Africa in general. Uh, in Mozambique, we are uh, uh, operating a very important port that links, again, uh, landlocked countries through Mozambique. Uh, in Central Africa, uh, in Rwanda, we are growing. Uh, with a dry port that is growing every year, catering into the needs. So what, what changed with us as DP World? We were only operating as a port operating company, a company that only worked inside the port. As we start to see that there are many activities in cargos that are outside the port and we realize that being inside the terminal only to operate makes us really blind to what happens outside and mm. also doesn't allow us to add value in changing the complexity or the inefficiency of the supply chain yeah. so the change happened in 2016 when we started to change where we invested in logistics and many parts of the supply chain where basically today we are now operating into an end to end solution. So we are in charge of the cargo from the factory floor to the customer door. Yeah. And that is very important in Africa because last mile is very difficult in Africa. True. And this is where we added investment yeah. uh, with uh, Imperial Logistics, where they are well established in many markets and they can do the last mile for the customer that we promised them to handle their business. Yeah, and that's interesting for me because when I look at what you are doing and what you've just described, I am seeing really here the recreation or the reconfiguration of trade routes on the African continent and aligning them to the Africa continental free trade area. So I want to bring in your thoughts on the opportunities that are offered by the Africa continental free trade area and what remains to be done in connecting those nodes that you are now building. Well, the... Uh Africa trade is, is an amazing news because Africa, like many uh, developing markets, uh, suffered from the same problem. If you look at inter-Africa trade, it's very special. While in developed markets, like in EU, uh, inter-continental uh, trade in Europe is maybe 60-65% while in Africa, it's maybe 10%. That means if you are in Nigeria, 
you probably would import something from Europe faster and more than you import from your neighbor around you. And the reason for that are many. One of them is uh, infrastructure inability uh, due to uh, not easy transportation system between countries, uh, systems like uh, border regulation, customs, and all that. I believe that the, in, a, in addition to the infrastructure, which companies like us can always fix, yeah. the issues where we can't fix when it comes to regulations. But with the African trade, we are very, very happy uh, with that because this will now allow many African countries to share similar regulations on import of cargo and regulation within their uh, market. And most importantly, that the trade will move without custom duty, which is very important uh, for Africa. Yeah, and I want to know if you are beginning to see movement in that direction as an investor, as you have said, in infrastructure and recognizing the vital need for efficient infrastructure systems, especially on the African continent. Are you seeing enough being done at a government level? And then secondly, what are your thoughts on what the AU has done so far in trying to simplify these trade rules as part, of course, of the AFCFTA? Well, first of all, uh, there's never been enough. So even when, when we say we see uh, amazing changes, I yeah. think there is still more to be done. And uh, infrastructure, rails, even uh, electricity connections between countries where a country doesn't need it in an area where another country needs it, surplus, all this uh, is important for Africa. Uh, the, when you look at Africa, it's totally different than what people looked at it uh, or European used to think of it in the past, where there is not many educated people and Africa is only a country where you need raw materials. It has changed. Today, you have highly educated people in Africa, very, very enlightened leaders who are really determined to develop their countries. I can give you a few names like Paul Kagame in Rwanda, like Maki Sal in uh, uh, Senegal, like uh, William Roto in uh, Kenya, uh, like the president of uh, uh, Tanzania. Uh, many, many African leaders are more enlightened and more determined to lift their people in poverty and make changes that you never even heard about in the past. And this is what I've been seeing when I meet these great leaders. It sounds to me like you are more excited than you are despondent or perhaps uh, unenthusiastic about uh, investments on the African continent. Perhaps uh, I wanted, uh, before we move on to the next stage of our conversation, I wanted to ask, because what you have done, and you described it to me now, you have put up uh, a hub in the West, you have got a hub in the East, you have got uh, a presence in Central Africa and in Southern Africa, you're in Mozambique, you of course uh, bought Imperial, a South African company which ties up the continent. So I want to know if there's anything that remains with where you are, are, are targeting to try to make that picture complete? Well, we, we, we are a company that uh, relates to cargo. So TV World will always be where there's cargo. And uh, look, for example, in Somalia, when not many people want to be in Somalia, we are in both mm. Somaliland and in Puntland, where we develop a, a very interesting port in, Bar in Barbara, which is really now becoming an important big port with the best equipment and uh, a free trade zone that will create industries. And the same thing also in Portland, where we're developing the port to cater to the needs. And what we are doing in Africa, we are also uh, want to replicate what we've done in Dubai. Uh, success of Dubai port, where you have a port and you have a, an industrial park next to it. This connection, and connectivity and relation works very well for the country. And so in Dubai, we have Jabali Free Zone, Industrial Park, we have Logistic Park, and we have the airport in, within a very short distance from each other. The same thing we're trying to build in Africa. And Africa have more to offer than in Dubai. A lot of uh, products produced uh, or, or produced in Africa 
many agriculture products mm. uh, that are used as raw material. And you will be using materials produced in Europe, and you are not aware that these actually were originally in Africa. Mm. So Africa lost the brand of their product today by building industrial parks near the port, like we're doing in the Congo, uh, uh, Kinshasa, or we're doing in Senegal, or we're doing in uh, uh, Barbara, uh, or Rwanda, allowing the local product to be produced there and packed and instead of sending it as raw material out of the country. Raw material only uh, maybe give job to the agriculture sector, which is big, but manufacturing and packing give a new industry. And it is cheaper, actually, to produce in the country where the product is produced. Yeah. And we're looking at many products today which can be uh, done. And we are doing that with uh, Imperial, which has uh, an amazing track record in contract manufacturing and uh, packaging and distribution. Mm -hmm. So here we are uh, creating jobs for people to produce and pack a product they many they basically produce in their own country, whether it is in mining or whether it is in agriculture or whatever. At the same time, we have the ability as a company with the experience with industrial park, like we did in Dubai, to really give this miles of success. And yeah. then, uh, powered with imperial ability and logistics, we can move it in Africa faster than anybody can move it in and out. And that is a big advantage where the shipping line really appreciate the ability to pick it up from the port rather than go and get involved in moving it from wherever they are. In Rwanda today, we pick the product like coffee or tea yeah. from the farmers and pack it and bring it to the uh, park, uh, the, the dry port, and then it goes around the world. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I really hope that works. But um, I wanted to just check and clarify this. In terms of your approach to Africa, is it more logistics or ports and uh, 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 other maritime activities? Or is it a wholesome approach that you are taking where you are creating these ecosystems, where you are connecting the airports uh, to the ports uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the exit points as well? It is a wholesome approach. Right. You cannot have only one bit. You'll be missing the other. Luckily, DB World, we are very experienced. Industrial Park, the most successful one in the world is actually And then uh, we are very good at logistics. We invested a lot in the field. And we are good port operators. So when we couple that with the relation with the airport, the sea air and air, and air sea cargo, then you get a, you need intermodal facilities, which we have for the customer so that they have the choice of using the best, most efficient mode of transportation to take the cargo out of the country and in the country. Yeah. When you look at uh, trade flows across uh, the region in Africa, and uh, feel free, of course, to talk about uh, connecting this to your broader global strategy, are you seeing an improvement in volumes? I mean, you are in uh, logistics, you are in uh, global supply chains, and we know uh, what COVID did. We know what the Ukraine war did in terms of uh, disrupting uh, those uh, connections. What's the picture that you are seeing now uh, when you survey your global reach and uh, the African continent? We see growth, okay? Uh, maybe in Europe, uh, not significant because of whatever uh, happening in Europe, but uh, in general, there is growth. We look at the green numbers of growth uh, in all our terminals around the world. Uh, yes, 23 is expected not to be as good as uh, last year, maybe on the shipping rates, on whatsoever, but as far as the cargo growth is going to grow. China was under lockdown, China is open today. Uh, a lot of cargo that was stuck in China is moving out. So we, we feel comfortable about uh, the expectation. Uh, yes, there are geopolitical issues, but this is part of life. We always have They never prevent it. People need to eat. People need to consume. People need to trade. People need to live. That will continue. And uh, wherever you see a problem, another area doesn't have a problem. Luckily, we are today in over 137 locations yeah. around the globe. So would you say the worst is over 
in terms of uh, those supply chain disruptions that we saw? I don't think it's over. I think it is much less uh, surprise than in the past. We have been through a lot in the past. We managed to get out of it. What I can say is there is nothing that worries us that you can't deal with anymore. We've been in the wars. We've seen a lot of issues in the past, coupled with not only supply chain inefficiency, but also with the COVID, with whatever restriction we had. Mm -hmm. That is over to me. As far as geopolitical, this is part of, uh, of life, and this is part of what you see everywhere. It's not strange, but we can deal with it. I don't see major issues happening. I see that this year we're looking at it with uh, a bit of concern and to watch our business and to make sure that we are ready for any uh, thing. But the experience we have in the last two years, I think, gave us some knowledge of how to deal with complications in the supply chain. Yeah, we well, certainly hope uh, there will be a thing of the past that we can refer to uh, as uh, something that happened to us and uh, we move on. So let's uh, move the conversation a little bit to a wider subject. Now we have seen the world of course consumed by worries about climate change and businesses all across the world moving to try to find ways of uh, mitigating uh, the damage that's been done by the, uh, uh, these greenhouse uh, gases from a business such as yours. What can you contribute? Well, we are, first of all, we are committed to the policies we have in our country as well as worldwide. The IMO have uh, issued certain direction regarding uh, using fuel that is less harmful to the environment. But in our case, we are using every method to reduce carbon emissions. In Jabari, for example, all our buildings, the offices are all uh, powered by solar. And so we use solar. Uh, during the day and at night we use the uh, power from the government. Uh, we use even ingenious ways in our equipment to go away from uh, diesel fuel into electric. And we've done it in many places in the world, which turned out to be uh, much cheaper. So when you talk about the environment, you talk about the, uh, the green and you talk about the uh, protecting the environment and lower carbon emission, a lot of people come to their mind it's going to cost us more. I can tell you from our experience, when we switched to green, less harmful methods in running our business, it mm. is much cheaper and we save more money. Oh, I was actually going to ask you if it uh, adds more cost to your way of doing business. It doesn't. I can give you an example. In Jabali, when we uh, changed the light bulb from a uh, bulb that really used a lot of electricity to LED, the cost of doing conversion was 10 million dirhams, and the cost for electricity was 10 million a year for that. And that means now it's a fraction less, less than a million for the electricity of what we used to spend, spend 10 million every year. And it cost us to convert to only 10 million. That's one example, and there are many, many examples. When you use equipment that are using diesel, your maintenance is always high. And when you are suddenly switching to uh, electric, you don't have that maintenance problem. You don't have the oil to change, you don't have a lot of breakdown, and you don't have the emissions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I wanted to get back to the investment world because I saw an opinion piece that you wrote, I think it was uh, last month. Yes, it was last month. Uh, and uh, in it, you argue that private investment alone is not the answer to Africa's problems. In fact, you say what is required is uh, public-private partnerships. Just explain uh, how you think this could well work. Well, all of our investment around the world is in private-public partnership. In every country, in Senegal, we are part of the government. So our partners are the government. But that is in the ports. What I want to say is there are many opportunities in infrastructure, actually, like railroads, like electricity, power, like water, uh, purification. Many projects today needed uh, capital. And we need to have policy to encourage the private capital to come into that market, mm -hmm. to come into this business, because it is needed. And uh, the only way to develop these projects, governments cannot build them by themselves. Mm -hmm. It needs a private-public partnership. It needs laws issued to protect the private party, uh, partnership uh, businesses and to encourage them. And that is needed in Africa. Yeah. Opinion.
Is, is it difficult to make those negotiations? I ask the question because often when you speak to businesses that operate on the continent, you often hear the fact that uh, you're struggling with uh, inefficiency, you're struggling with people uh, looking for bribes, you struggle with uh, a bureaucracy that is just slow and is not uh, structured efficiently to make sure you, you negotiate as quickly as possible when, you come, when it comes to investment. How has been your experience? Experience was good. We never uh, really uh, encountered these issues. These are the past, really. Uh, if you, you know how to deal with them. I mean, if you go to the government directly and the top people, uh, you know, then you have no issue. And people who use uh, brokers or use somebody in between, this can happen. Okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, when you go to infrastructure and you go to private partnership, you need uh, the public money. Uh, today, to build a project, uh, if you borrow from banks, commercial banks, it's going to be very expensive. It mm. is high. When you got uh, like a private capital where yeah. they are not only lending, but they are investing, then you reduce your interest. Yeah. Uh, of course, you reduce the cost of finance because there is an added value that the company that is in, uh, lending, they are actually partners. Yeah. And if the business is done in a way that the company sees a benefit and a good return or reasonable return in capital, you will see many people flocking to Africa to fund the projects. Absolutely. And I, I see an interesting example of your public-private partnership. Uh, you uh, partnered with the UK's British International Investment. I wanted to know how that works. Is that you uh, leading the project and bringing them in, or is this a truly uh, a, a joint venture? What's been the approach and thinking there? It's a very interesting uh, project where they didn't have an investment like that before. This is their biggest investment. And uh, they liked what we have mm. uh, in Egypt and in, uh, in other areas. And then when we offered them Somaliland, they were a bit uh, concerned and we convinced them. We told them Somaliland is a uh, country that has actually uh, developed their system. They have. Uh, a parliament, they have a, a peaceful country, and uh, this will bring other investments. And they were able to accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we encourage them because today, the biggest money come to Africa come from China. And China is doing an amazing job in, in developing many projects, nobody wants to look at it. Mm -hmm. But the West have left Africa, and they should come in. And so to bring uh, BII into Africa is really uh, a good achievement we are able to do. Yeah, and it's actually one of those examples where the Ukraine war has done us a favor in part because now suddenly where they were coming with conditions, they are now having to perhaps negotiate more uh, with us in good faith. But I wanted to know your approach in terms of financing these projects. Is it you uh, just uh, putting up your capital or uh, you also seek out uh, borrowing in order to augment the finances that are required for these projects? Uh, remember uh, when we uh, build something, we put part of it from more resources and the rest we, we, we borrow money. So the choice was, should we borrow money or should we go to BII and get them as a part? And we, we selected to bring them. They, they bring a lot of value for us. So it was for us better than bringing just a commercial loan. Absolutely. Um, I've got a couple of minutes for us to talk about uh, your view on the continent as a whole. So I'm assuming you are wanting to come and uh, invest more on the African continent. I'm saying to you, what is your message to a government official or a private business person who's listening to this and thinking, I'd like to work with DP World? Well, uh, we will come working with everybody. Uh, but when you talk about Africa, I am very passionate about Africa. I see growth because we've been in Africa since 2007. And we've seen the growth. In fact, more than that, early 2000. And uh, we've seen growth, we've seen opportunities. And yes, Africa is difficult. Yes, there are many complications. But with the right approach uh, and the right idea, uh, you will get in investment and you will get a welcoming hand wherever you go. Uh, it's a great uh, place. Uh, there are huge opportunities. It needs patience. It needs time, and you need to put money. Yeah. And that is something we're willing to do. 
Yeah, and in terms of that growth, uh, I want to try and uh, get an idea of uh, whether that's uh, more in ports or that's more in uh, logistics or that's more in the industrial parks uh, that you've been putting up in other parts of the world. Well, uh, it depends on each country. Uh, we, we need to see more industrial parks. I really believe in that. We've done it in Dubai. We've seen what it does to our country. When you go to Jabal Ali, which provide 38% uh, free zone to the GDP. Imagine what you could do in Africa. Much more. And uh, we encourage many African countries, wherever we build a port, we need an industrial park next to it. We need somewhere where we can have activities and added value. Because bringing cargo in and out give you little value. But uh, more added value will be when there are people who are working. And it relates to really a very important uh, rule we have. Uh, when we look at a country, we look at the GDP. The higher the growth of the GDP, every year, the more we'll be interested to come in. Because there is a formula. 1% uh, growth in GDP will produce 3% growth in cargo. So when we are a country, if we need to see more GDP growth, and we, if we want to see more cargo growth, then we have to increase the GDP. GDP growth is very important for growth of the cargo we handle. And that's why we are always want to put an industrial park, because that anchors the cargo in that country, and that produces cargo more for the port. Absolutely. Uh, encouraging message there coming through from uh, Sultan Ahmed bin uh, Sulayem, uh, who is the chairman and uh, chief executive officer of uh, DP World. Seth, thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for your time. We look more uh, to interactions with you as uh, you spread your wings across the continent, providing, as you said yourself, uh, the jobs and uh, the contribution to GDP that uh, Africa so desperately needs. Thank you. You've been watching Captains of Industry from all of us here at CNBC Africa. Thank you for watching and goodbye for now.